everybody and welcome to our virtual presentation of the UNA Forum presents the 25th United Nations Association Film Festival. Uh, we are extremely happy that uh, we have in our virtual presentation um, several filmmakers. So the film festival will start on October 20th and will go to October 30th. We are presenting 16 documentaries that truly will change your view of the world and we will have in person a lot of filmmakers here in Palo Alto, Stanford University, East Palo Alto, and San Francisco. Um, our focus and our theme is uh, reflections. So we are going to reflect of 25 years of UNAV. Also, we'll reflect what has been changed since this 25 years of existence of UNAV and what's happening uh, in our community and what's happening in the world. So our filmmakers are bringing uh, this uh, fascinating documentaries for our community and also um, we are going to have uh, uh, screenings and panels. So we'll have six panels um, and our uh, filmmakers will be involved with our experts to talk about the issues uh, again, uh, which are happening in, uh, in, uh, in the world and at home. So um, our film festival, United Nations Association Film Festival is based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which was created and uh, uh, founded by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948. And since then, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights became one of the most important documents in the world. So for all these 25 years, all our films are created and actually reflecting through this, uh, the most important uh, um, pamphlet in the world, uh, which is uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So talking about that, as I said, uh, we are privileged and uh, we uh, love to, to present you our uh, filmmakers uh, today in, in, in our discussion. And we are focusing on Russia and Ukraine uh, and uh, among other films that we are going to see for the 11 days. So uh, we'll have uh, Anna and Katya, Paulina and Stefan to tell us a little bit about their films and also uh, to tell us um, my first question for them is going to be, uh, what uh, has changed uh, since you finished your film? And I will start actually with Paulina and uh, her film, uh, Price of Conflict. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Paulina Herman. I'm producer. Um, our team finished this movie in January, 2022. Literally in a month, Russia started a full scale war. Uh, so many things have changed. In the film, uh, we talked about the difficult economic situation in Donbass. Now there is a difficult economic situation in all Ukraine. Uh, a few days ago, Russia began shelling more peaceful cities. Bombs fell in the center of Kiev, Lvov, uh, Dnipro, Mykolaiv, and so on. Many people died. If we are talking, uh, talking about a uh, critical infrastructure, infrastructure uh, damage, uh, power plants all over the country due to which in Kyiv the power went out for four hours a day. In Lviv there was no electricity and internet for several days. Our film Director stay in Ukraine now, and now he is volunteer and make a new films about war. Also, some people from the film team went to defend our country from February 2022, and the film DOP Alexander Navrotsky was uh, seriously injured uh, and uh, currently uh, recovering in the hospital. As far as I know, all the experts are alive and uh, unharmed. Uh, one thing remains unchanged. Uh, we will fight for all territories of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your updates, Paulina. And uh, um, it is uh, Obviously, we feel for all the people in Ukraine and uh, what is happening right now is uh, um, a huge tragedy. Um, and we are really appreciative that you're going to present the film Price of Conflict at the 25th UNAF. Let's see the trailer.
Антитерористична операція на Сході із локальної перетворилася на війну. Бої в районі Дебальцева йдуть п'яти сутки. Хватить кормити Запад. Вот этими руками, горбом. Предприятия угольной промышленности Донецкой Народной Республики готовы принять на работу более 3700 шахтеров. Нашу шахту, Никанор Новая, закрываю. Мы сейчас без ничего, у нас 20 месяцев задолженности. Это сделали украинские власти. Ввели сплошную экономическую блокаду. Территория, которая не может вообще ничего инвестировать никуда. Она сама живет на дотации Российской Федерации. Я видел от... Двух до пяти миллиардов долларов в год для Москвы, чтобы поддержать социоэкономическую основу этих территорий. Сейчас главный в ДНР Пушин, через который идет уголь. На Купченко. Его представляют, как будто он весь организатор этой схемы и главный виновник. Но по факту он только исполнитель. Что и здесь вывозят в Игиле, то выключено через Российскую Федерацию. В портах во время погрузки в судно происходит смешивание части ростовского угля с большей долей донбасского угля. Донбасс им не нужен. Если бы он был нужен, Донбасс, оттуда бы не вывозили заводы. Не вырезали металл. Thank you, uh, Paulina. Uh, and then we just saw the uh, clip, actually the trailer from Price uh, the, of Conflict, uh, um, and this is going to be presented in um, our 25th UNAF. Uh, so, well, Paulina, can you just tell us, um, in your opinion, uh, what do you think will actually happen next in the situation? Uh, every Ukrainian is now uh, fighting uh, on his own front. I'm fighting on the culture front. Uh, some are on the real military front. Some are raiding the country's economy. In my opinion, there are two uh, further uh, developments. Either the Russians will stop this war or the Ukrainians will defeat Russia. Ukrainian will win in any case, but only Russia can stop this war. Ukrainians have to choose to continue fighting it or not. Uh, we are fighting it for our territories, but Russia can leave our territories at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, Katya, uh, with your film, The Long Breakup, obviously, you know both sides very well. And uh, this is a liberation in your film. Uh, and uh, uh, just tell us what, what happened since the film was finished. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of things are happening. But what was the reaction to, the, to your presentation? Well, uh, thank you so much for having me here and for letting me speak about the film and the subject. Uh, just to echo what Paulina just said, uh, as we speak right now, Russia uh, launched another series of very serious, massive attacks on Ukrainian cities and civilians. And uh, not that it's uh, new, uh, Ukraine has been under attack for seven something months. But uh, the reality is that my film was shot uh, mostly in Kharkiv. This is where I'm from. And that uh, city, it's the second largest city in Ukraine, has been affected by the war uh, a lot. You know, um, my characters lived in, in Kharkiv. I myself am from Kharkiv. So uh, I finished my film in 2020 when the war in Ukraine was on, the one that started in 2014, uh, but before February 24th, 2022. So in my film, even though I talk about the war, it's not that all out war that we all watching right now and fighting. Um, so very typically for a lot of residents from Kharkiv, the characters from my film had to flee almost right away because uh, Kharkiv right on the border with Russia, only 20 miles away or so. So 
people from my film, uh, including my parents, who are one of the, I would say, main character characters, they had to be evacuated. Everybody had their own path, but they're all over now. Nobody's living at home. They cannot come back because the city has been bombed every single day. And again, as we speak, uh, many civilians uh, had to flee their homes again, even though they tried to return, not just in Kharkiv, but everywhere else. And uh, the way that this war is going uh, affected uh, the city itself. If we consider the city as a character, it's not the same city as you would see in my film. And partially, maybe it's good because then people who watch the long breakup, they will see what Ukraine was like before the war, because now what people all over the world see is just destruction, explosions, mass graves, killed people, all things that are par uh, consequences of this war. But in my film, you would see the way Ukraine was before this uh, all-out war. Uh, let's see uh, the trailer from the long breakup. Brooklyn has become my home, but I am not from here. No, I think that Russian and Ukrainians are really one nation. I was born on the Soviet side of the Iron Curtain. My childhood is full of marching and parading. I love Lenin. Two revolutions force me to face my country's past as it fights for its future. Protesters clashed with riot police in an ongoing confrontation that has left at least two people dead. I can't believe that Ukraine has elected an ex-convict as its president. Will Ukraine be with Russia or with Europe? О том, что будет до такой степени беспредельно, о том, что будет такая концентрация власти в одних руках. I'm throwing myself into a rift between two cultures. My city becomes a battleground, and it's not clear which side will win. Anyone who has a Ukrainian connection can't stay indifferent right now. So, Katya, also as a journalist, um, what is your perspective of the coverage of media and, and how the people are really, uh, really getting the knowledge of what's happening? Well, uh, covering this type of uh, events, it's very difficult. I live in New York and I curate uh, some portion of coverage for my publication for Forbes uh, Media. We work with Forbes Ukraine from Ukraine and we get the information from Ukraine, not from some Western agencies that sometimes maybe do not understand the root of the conflict and um, do not uh, report accurately on events. So my job is to make sure that we don't have misleading headlines, that we do not report things that can be perceived uh, in the wrong way because context for reporting this war is even more important than just traditional journalism rules. Uh, so that's uh, you know what I try to do, but in terms of coverage, uh, I would have to say that unfortunately, you often see misleading headlines from companies like Reuters, even AP, even CNN, even when I watch what some of the other companies are doing. When you start getting really into the details, uh, sometimes it's not reported accurately, but at the same time, there are great, brave journalists, reporters for media outlets all around the world are in Ukraine right now, and they do provide accurate information. So it's just uh, sometimes you need experienced editors who know how to present this information. Thank you, Katya. I'm talking obviously about independent reporters and the filmmakers. We have Anna, uh, who is uh, uh, representing an independent uh, newspaper in Moscow. Uh, Nova Gazeta, and uh, she is director of the assassination of Anna, Crime Without Punishment. Um, this is the documentary which go back to what we presented in 2011, the taste of freedom about Anna Politoskaya, who was actually killed 
um, because of reporting about Chechen uh, conflict. So, so Anna, um, tell us what was uh, uh, new and what is actually uh, what happened uh, since you created the documentary. Uh, our movie uh, is a story about 15 years uh, past since Anna Politkovska, journalist of Novaya Gazeta, was murdered uh, in Moscow. And we are talking, we're just making a story about how editorial office and Novaya Gazeta have been living for 15 years and how journalists continue Anna Politkovska's topics and her, uh, uh, her profession. And actually, exactly the day our movie was released last year, uh, Nobel Committee announced that chief editor of Nova Gazeta and chief editor of Anna Politkovska, Dmitry Muratov, uh, was awarded by Nobel Peace Prize. And Dmitry Muratov uh, spoke a brilliant, inspiring um, speech, uh, Nobel speech dedicated to journalists uh, focusing and uh, on, uh, uh, he, he said that uh, freedom is a condition of progress and independent journalists are antidote to tyranny. And, you know, you can find it in YouTube and it's really extremely humanistic and really cool. So watch it if you didn't see it yet. And it was a great joy and honor for all Russian journalists because, you know, it was like a support for all the community and it was really touching because and at the end of his speech Dmitry Muratov asked the audience stand up uh, for a minute of silence in memory of Anna Politkovska and in memory of all killed journalists and it was a really you know heartbreaking and touching moment so um Anna let's, let's see the the trailer from the film um assassination one Аня Политковская очень подолгу занималась темой, связанной с Чечней, с пленными, с незаконными военными операциями, с преступлениями против человечности, с заложниками. Она вела себя со своими героями, со своими вот этими ходаками, как человек. А не просто писала заметки и перелистывала страницу блокнота. Боже мой, я не военный журналист, я гражданский человек, я боюсь вообще всего, что стреляет. Беслан. 1 сентября захватывают школу. Террористы с детьми в зале школы номер один. Вот они умеют только взрывать. Если будет штурм, будут идти. Я думаю, что я перестану быть журналистом, я уж больше не могу. Просто на ней не было лица, и вот на этом диванчике она сидела и рассказывая о том, о своих впечатлениях с этим интервью, и от Кадырова, и то, через что она прошла, у нее дрожали руки, и она просто не сдержалась, она плакала. Она зашла в подъезд собственного дома, поднялась к лифту, вызвала его, зашла внутрь кабинки, и тут ее настиг киллер, который ожидал в подъезде. Пять выстрелов в упор. Государство знает, кто был заказчиком убийства по найму Анны Политковской. We just saw the trailer from the documentary Assassination of Anna, Crime Without Punishment. Uh, so Anna, um, as Anna was brave to write about the Chechen war and obviously to write about the human tragedy. So uh, what, is, what is the situation right now with all your colleagues and your, you uh, writing about what's happening in Ukraine? Uh, on February, Russian Federation started a criminal war against Ukraine, and just a few days after, uh, Russian authorities declared uh, a military censorship in the country. So uh, uh, covering uh, hostilities became illegally, and even slogan, no war, you can first you get a fine and then you go to prison just for saying no war, um, and only trans uh, translate uh, 
translate, <laughs> sorry, uh, only if you um, uh, say uh, an official position of Ministry of Defense, only that kind of news you can do. So there is no journalism in Russia anymore. So most of my colleagues that you could see in a movie are journalists of Nova Gazeta. Uh, they had to move from Russia because uh, more than 100,000 media and resources were blocked because of censorship. And uh, Nova Gazeta website media license was uh, canceled by Russian court and Nova Gazeta is not publishing anymore. So some of colleagues had to leave Russia and they founded Nova Gazeta of Europe in Riga, Lithuania, and they continue work from there. But some of journalists still uh, staying in Russia, in Moscow or in other cities, trying to work from here, being very careful and facing risk and trying to do something they can do to inform people because now Russia just covered by terrible uh, uh, military propaganda and saying that war is good and black is white. Uh, and Dmitry Muratov is still in Russia and um, he uh, sold his Nobel Prize at uh, New York Heritage Auction for record price of one million and three one more than 103 million dollars and he donated all this money to unicef foundation to help and support ukrainian refugees and children and that's all we can do so at the moment uh, the situation is really difficult and for journalists in russia it's a really really uh, bad time thank you um, they safe and obviously talking about censorship and talking about the controversial issues in Russia. Uh, we have Stefan, whose film uh, Russia versus Russia is going to be presented in our 25th June. Stefan, um, uh, give us the updates what happened since you created this documentary. Well, uh, my idea was to show the other Russia, another Russia than the one. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, image Vladimir Putin is giving and the idea that uh, Russia is attacking Ukraine. It is true, but it is also not uh, fair to the Russian people because a lot of Russians and in particular my characters and testimony witnesses in that film. Uh, for example, uh, there is this incredibly courageous Vladimir Karamurza with a, was a, with a politician uh, with, who was poisoned twice and uh, who uh, escaped Russia for his family, but he came back to keep struggling. And now he's been arrested and uh, every uh, audience of his trial is being, is being charged with other higher, uh, like treason last time. And uh, my, even my crew, my crew, because I filmed during the COVID uh, situation, which was a, a good occasion for the regime to close the uh, borders. So I had to film remotely with uh, incredibly courageous crews from Moscow. And uh, even my, my, the journalist I worked with, she fled the country herself, like did before her, the people we were filming. So it's my idea at first was to show what was this the reality of this regime behind a facade of respectability which allowed it for so many years in the west to present some kind of uh, acceptable uh, political situation and fortunately and now my film was pro broadcast on the 20th uh, on the uh, 15th of february one week before the war and it's been going down and down and down. That's so let's, yeah, Stefan, let's see the trailer from the documentary Russia versus Russia. Если он действительно так популярен, как он говорит, то почему он так боится допускать своих оппонентов? Наша вина в том, что в России выросло поколение, которым сейчас 20-30 лет, которые 
с этим винегретом в голове из западных ценностей и русской действительности живут. Проработала на ней, вот оттуда меня ну, уволили, потому что я политический активист. Все люди имеют право выражать свою точку зрения. Действует группа профессиональных убийц на службе государства. Меня отравили дважды. У отравления не было раз. Второе. Это чистой воды провокация против России, которая была предпринята немцами. Два. Ну или американцами, или французами. Мне все равно. Пришел Путин. Он начал поднимать нашу страну. Свобода, полиция, I don't know, the bad and good. I, I would never have thought I would say such a thing, but really it's like, let's say evil, because what's at stake is freedom and not only freedom for Ukraine, it's freedom for the world, the free world, which means that the, the fighters in Ukraine are fighting for us. So, that, so I don't know, the military situation is uh, better than we thought when we feared when uh, we thought that uh, they would take over Kiev in three days. But of course, it's only battles after battles, and it's not meaning to win the war. So uh, with all this, we are going to actually end um, our uh, um, conversation and continue the conversation uh, during the 25th United Nations Association Film Festival. Uh, you had the privilege to to see our filmmakers um, on this virtual studio, and they're going to be with us in person in Palo Alto, Stanford University, San Francisco, and East Palo Alto from October 20th to October 30th. Uh, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary, uh, and again, uh, which is the festival, and all our conversation and our work is based on the universal declaration of human rights. So we really invite you to bring um, your members of the families, bring your friends, bring everybody uh, to the festival and let's open a discussion about the dialogue, how to end the wars and then bring peace and humanity wherever we can. So thank you so much for being with us. Ooh.